The rival school series has always held a soft spot in many fighting game fans' hearts for the unique elements it brought to the table, and considering that Capcom will be bringing back one of the roster members, Akira Kazama, as a Street Fighter V DLC fighter, I felt that the timing is probably right to remind everybody as to why this series is as beloved as it is. In today's content we are going to take a deep dive look at every single entry in the Rival School series, and after that, even revisit the Capcom vs Tatsunoko games. Further, Capcom published 3D polygonal tag team fighting games that would feature the return of Batsu, a Rival School's character who many consider their absolute favourite. So without further ado, welcome to the movie lemp Rival Schools documentary. Yeah! The year is 1997. We are at that pivotal time in history where the majority of gaming companies are using a great deal of their financial resources to pour into the development of 3D polygon based games. Gaming was changing at such a rapid rate at the time. Many development houses could not keep up with the trend and lack the skills or hardware necessary to be able to deliver the goods. Bad 3D games featuring high-end intellectual properties were popping up everywhere, with some really notable falls from grace, such as Earthworm Jim 3D, which was so bad that it looked like it had killed off the franchise for good. Capcom, on the other hand, decided against instantly throwing all of their efforts into the 3D polygon ring and instead would continue to make many 2D sprite based games. This would mean that Street Fighter 3, the company's long awaited sequel to Street Fighter 2, would remain in 2D. With the game's general producer, Norotaki Funamizu, admitting that we feel that 3D is not really suitable for head to head fighting. And, to be frank, Capcom doesn't really have the techniques to display high quality graphics in 3D. Despite this very statement from Capcom existing, all we had to do was look around at the time to be able to see that Soul Blade, Tekken 2 and 3 were all on the market and all three of these titles were hugely popular head to head fighting games, which featured 3D polygons. So the part regarding Capcom not having the techniques available to display high quality 3D graphics appears to be the truer part of that statement. In terms of fighting games, on the 2D side of things Capcom would continue to release enhanced versions of Street Fighter 3 and Street Fighter Alpha. In addition to this, they would also continue to release new entries within the Capcom vs series, and would even release Darkstalkers 3 by 1997. Away from Capcom's biggest fighting game cash cows, it does not mean that the company would not begin to test the water developing games featuring the new trendy 3D graphical styles. The first of these would arrive in arcades in 1996 with the arrival of Star Gladiator Episode 1 for Final Crusade. This 3D weapons based fighting game would be programmed to run on PlayStation based ZM1 arcade hardware as opposed to the usual CP boards developed by Capcom themselves. The game marks Capcom's first ever in-house polygonal fighting game and would see a release in Japan in a similar time frame to when Street Fighter 3 would debut. The game's arcade version, along with its PlayStation port, were both relatively well received, which I guess must have influenced the company somewhat in taking further steps in the 3D direction. Around this time, Street Fighter EX would also debut in the arcades, a 3D polygon based fighting game featuring Capcom's biggest IP. The catch with this one though, was that it was not developed by Capcom, but instead the company were only the publisher. The task at hand with this one was outsourced to the development house, Arika, which was ran by former Capcom employees who had worked on Street Fighter 2 previously. A whole calendar year after the release of all of these games, Rival Schools would debut in Japanese arcades in November of 1997, using the Sony ZN2 hardware. If Street Fighter EX was the game that brought Street Fighter to the realm of 3D, then you could argue that mechanically, Rival Schools was Capcom's 3D Capcom vs game. The game had originally entered development when director Hideki Itsuno wanted to make a 60 frames per second polygon based fighting game, as Capcom's earlier 3D title, Star Gladiator, was only set to 30 frames per second. The working title for the game was originally Justice Fist, and featured a generic story about fighters coming together from around the world to prove who was the strongest. 
Hideki showed this concept to others at Capcom. However, they were underwhelmed, so he would go back to the drawing board to try and come back with something more interesting. The final concept would introduce the high school setting, with Hideki's thought track being that practically everyone has had school experiences. So I guess the rest from there is history. Anyway, let's check out this game's intro. So, from the game's brief introduction, we can instantly identify a few similarities between this game and Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter, released earlier that same year. Capcom's characters are all depicted using an anime art style, and more importantly, the game seems to heavily feature air combat, but we will discuss more on these points very shortly. Upon inserting your first credit into one of these cabinets, you reach the player select screen prompting you to choose from a selection of different characters. All characters are represented via anime illustrations, rather than with 3D graphics at this point. Upon selecting your character, the game will prompt you to pick another additional fighter, which means you guessed it. Like the Marvel and Capcom vs series, this game consists of tag team matches players, which meant on release, this was Teddy Long's favourite polygon based fighting game. But we will discuss more about this in detail later. Holla holla holla. I guess we should talk about the game's story along with the characters found within it. The game takes place in a fictional Japanese city known as Auharu, a location where mysterious kidnappings and unprovoked attacks are taking place. Victims consist of several students and staff members from local high schools throughout the area. With all of this going on, a selection of students from each school seek out to investigate who is behind the crimes. The original arcade version of the game features 16 characters including the two bosses. These characters are representatives of five different high schools. It is reported that with the original arcade cabinet, a player selective team of two characters must be from the same school. However, arcade owners could enter a special operating code which removed the game's story and cutscenes to allow any combination of characters. Through this same method, the game's two boss characters can also be made selectable. So now, let us run through the rival schools, and look at the characters found within each one. First up, we have Teo High School, offering three playable students. Teo is a standard small-scale academy for carefree students. The school's fighters include Batsu, who is described as a hot-blooded, impulsive and foul-mouthed teenager, who possesses a strong sense of justice and a kind heart. This transfer student is positioned as the star and main protagonist of the rival school's game. Next up from Teo we have Hinata, a young girl who is passionate about martial arts, who tried to rally up the students of the school to take up arms with her in the fight against the unknown attacker. Finally, we have Kaiosuke, who I briefly spotlighted last week due to his presence in Capcom vs SNK2. He volunteers to help Batsu and Hinata with their investigation. However, there are further story twists involved as the game progresses. The next school to touch on is Gorin High, whose students focus on elite athletic training. The school's fighters consist of Shoma, a baseball master and a very strong fighter, Natsu, a volleyball player because nothing says tough like volleyball, and Roberto, a cool tempered soccer player who helps defuse his classmates when they get into arguments. 
The third school is Pacific High School for foreign exchange students from the USA, which I guess was featured in a cheap tacky effort for Capcom to try to appeal to the largest market in the world. The three characters reportedly planned to return home to the United States, but were ordered by this character Roy's father to help investigate. Roy is a self-proclaimed outsider, who later in the game is forced to rethink his feelings on Japan and its people. He is joined by the big busted Tiffany, who uses boxing as her fighting style, and Bowman, a large lad with a non-violent nature who agrees to help his classmates regardless. The fourth school is known as Guido High, which is reportedly full of gangs and delinquents. In this school we have Akira, who wears a full set of biker gear, Edge, who is a little twat who is known for picking fights and pulling out knives, and Gang, a member of a gang who simply lets its muscles do the talking, which makes him much less of a dick than Edge. Finally, we have Justice High, a super elite academy with a rigid and mysterious curriculum. This is a school rumoured to be housing the perpetrator who kidnapped the missing students and teachers. Out of its selectable fighters, it includes Hideo, a language teacher who is looking to get to the bottom of things, who is joined by Kayoko, the school's nurse. Also hailing from this school, we have the game's boss characters. The first of these is Reizo, the school's head teacher who is responsible for many of the characters' misfortunes throughout the game's story. Reizo is positioned as the game's main antagonist, however truths are later unearthed to reveal he is not the main villain of the story. The real final boss of the game is Hayo, who happens to be the head teacher's nephew. However, I will not spoil the game any further, in case you want to play through this yourself. In addition to the other playable characters, Sakura from the Street Fighter Alpha series also makes an appearance in the game as a secret unlockable character. She was apparently included as insurance due to the worries of bad sales. Capcom were hoping the Nota Street Fighter would further grab fans' attention. In all honesty, Sakura is beyond the perfect fit for this game. She is a Japanese high school student, so generally fits with the theme of the game anyway. But to add to this, her character design is based on the Japanese superhero schoolgirl archetype, much like Sailor Moon. When you bear in mind that the game features the same air combat as the Marvel vs Capcom series, she is the perfect fit and addition to the game's character lineup. Now we have got through the characters, let's start talking about gameplay, starting with tag teaming. The tagging mechanic does work differently from games within the vs series, and unfortunately you cannot simply switch between your two fighters with a tap of the button like you can with the 2D games. In rival schools, fights take place one-on-one -on -one between a combatant from each team, and victory is achieved through winning two rounds out of three. After a round, win or lose, the player has a choice between which of their two characters they would like to fight with within the following round. The main function of having two characters is that team-up attacks can be performed, moves that feature both of your fighters double-teaming an opponent. The team attacks can be executed when two levels of vigour are filled, where a special moves are also performable only costing one level of vigour. The game also features a combo system that functions very similar to the one found within the Versus series, where each character has launch attacks that allow for the use of air combos. In regards to the team attacks we touched on, some of these double team moves are not just attacks, but some feature as healing move combinations instead. The Vigor Gauge itself can actually be filled up to 9 levels, offering the opportunity to do multiple combinations of special and team attacks back to back. In terms of the game's controls, Rival Schools is played using two buttons for punching and two for kicking, with a light and heavy attack for each. This 4 attack button control scheme is more simplified than with some of the 6 button control schemes found with many other Capcom fighters, but works ideal for the Sony PlayStation's controller which would make sense considering that the system the game was always intended to be ported to was the PlayStation, with this being programmed for Sony ZN hardware after all. I guess mechanically, it is also worth mentioning that the game features a few defensive techniques that complement the character's offensive actions. This includes a technique known as Tardy Counters, which are similar to Alpha Counters found within the Alpha series. These allow players to counter attacks from blocking positions. Alpha counters from the Alpha series can only be used to counter certain special moves, where as tardy counters can work against hard, special or super attacks, 
The game also features attack counters which allow players to cancel incoming hits via timing their own hit with their opponent's attacks. These also offer an extra level of vigour when achieved. So that pretty much sums up all there is to know about the original arcade release of Rival Schools and how the game functioned. But what did critics of the time think of the game? Well, let us find out. Next Generation Magazine would write, Japanese schoolgirls anyone? If you like them, they're a big part of the premise behind Capcom's new polygonal fighter, Rival Schools United by Fate. The fighting scheme is still Street Fighter based, which helps make Rival Schools fun for any old Capcom fan. Graphically, Rival Schools is stupendous, with polygonal anime style character designs, clear attention to detail, and a wide playing field that's caught dramatically by a moving camera. Rival Schools is a decent game, but it ain't no Street Fighter, or even an X-Men for that matter. To be honest, Rival Schools is a button masher, but it's good. Clean button mashing packaged a little differently. Next Generation would give the arcade game 3 out of 5 stars, however sadly this was the only arcade review I could dig up, which is often the case when searching for reviews of arcade games from the time of this game's release. Being a game running off Sony ZN hardware, the game's next stop would be the Sony PlayStation, with the game slowly being released worldwide starting out in Japan in July of 1998. The port offered even more than the initial arcade game. The PlayStation version of the title would come spread across two CDs. On these discs, the first would include the original arcade game and standard modes you would find in most home conversions of fighting games. The game was enhanced with a new animated introduction, end sequences and a voiceover was added to the single player story mode. Two more characters were even added to the game including Hei Yato, a hot headed PE teacher and Diago, another teenage delinquent and gang member. That was all just on the first disc though. Disc 2 would be known as the Evolution Disc, featuring even more gameplay modes. This would include a range of mini-games based on student activities and would even include a character creation mode in the form of a dating sim. Through this mode you could create your own student, go through an academic year and develop friendships with any of the characters from the main game. This mode would shed further light on existing characters and their backgrounds. If one year in this mode is completed, the custom character could then be used in the arcade mode. Pretty innovative for what was essentially a fighting game, eh? Sadly, this character creation mode was abandoned outside of Japan, due to Capcom claiming it would have taken too much of an effort to translate it all from Japanese to English, especially when you take into account that even now, Dating sims are pretty much still a foreign concept to the West, so it is not surprising that this element of the game got dropped. Still though, Western releases would still receive the Evolution Disc, and other extra modes were still included. Westerners did not get the complete short end of the stick though, as instead the international version was given its own quirks. The designs and facial expressions in the Japanese creation mode were instead used to make more extra characters for the game. Not too bad at all really, who needs a dating sim anyway? Past this point in typical Capcom fashion, the game would receive an updated version, much like there are millions of versions of Street Fighter 2. The next version of the game featured two additional characters, Ran Hibiki, Teiyu High School's newspaper club photographer and Nagari Namukawa, a swimmer who studies at Gorin High School. In addition to this, the game would feature a new version of the school sim mode and feature more mini games. So now let us take a look at how the home version of this game was received by critics. GameSpot would state, the graphics are pretty faithful to the arcade version, although the characters are a bit more blocky than their arcade counterparts. Also some of the sprite effects such as explosions and fire look a little bad. The soundtrack is just about what you'd expect from a fighting game and sounds very Japanese. I wouldn't call Rival Schools a serious fighting game, but it's different enough to reel in those of us tired of Capcom's endless string of Street Fighter clones. All the additional modes help a lot on the multiplayer side of things, keeping the game fresh for a few extra months. 
If you're looking for an easy to pick up fighting game that puts a slightly new spin on the old fighting genre, Rival Schools fits the bill pretty well. IGN would add to this by stating, Rival Schools is a great example of how well Capcom can port over any of its fighting titles. The game maintains a solid frame rate with barely a missed piece of animation, and its characters all respond with near immediate moves. For Capcom fans, Rival Schools is not a letdown in the least, and it introduces as many as 20 characters into Capcom's character vault. Rival Schools is a high production affair with excellent looking graphics and a solid set of fighting techniques. Characters are relatively well balanced and the sidestepping works well to counter hasty opponents. So, as you can see the game was fairly well received in its day, getting solid 8 out of 10 review scores across the board. But an important question to pose as well now is how has the game aged today? Well, I guess it all depends on whether or not you can put up with extremely dated polygonal graphics. Sadly, aesthetically, the game has not aged quite as well as the likes of the Street Fighter Alpha series or the Capcom vs games, as early 3D does not offer the same appeal as polished refined 2D. Still though, from all the comments I have had asking me to cover the history of this game, it is clearly an important game that holds a place in the heart of many. I guess it simply did a lot of things right back in the day. It was really Capcom's first ever impressive 3D polygon based fighting game, after initially testing the water with the less refined Star Gladiator prior. This was also the first polygonal game to feature gameplay similar to that found in the Capcom vs series, whereas other popular games of this graphical style of the time mostly featured a gameplay style more similar to the more basic Street Fighter 2. To top this off, in terms of storytelling, I feel like the team behind this game made more of an effort to focus on the in-game story of this one than with any fighting game made prior and the amount of minigames and extras that Evolution Disc offered complements this factor strongly. Rival Schools really is a special little game that did a lot to stand out from the pack, and with all of this in mind it is no surprise that this title was the most popular Capcom game at the September 1997 Jammer Show, drawing much larger crowds than Street Fighter 3 Second Impact. The game followed graphical trends of the time, somewhat maintained a lot of traditional Capcom fighting game style, and innovated through great character design, storytelling and additional features. This ladies and gentlemen is why this game is important, and why one day it would even receive a true sequel. After the release of this game, things get a tad more chronologically confusing. The first Rival Schools game was known in Japan as this, which I am not even going to attempt to pronounce, but translates as Private Justice Academy Legion of Heroes. Now, as we know from discussing Rival Schools, the game would receive an updated re-release, much like what Capcom consistently do with Street Fighter 2, when they gave us super versions, turbo versions, etc. The updated version of Rival Schools was only released on the Sony PlayStation, exclusively in Japan under this title, which this time translates as Private Justice Academy Hot-Blooded Youthful Diary 2. Talk about a bloody mouthful, eh? The game would add additional characters, new minigames and an updated version of the school sim mode, but the title remained largely the same. The next instalment in the series, on the other hand, would be a true sequel to the original game, and would first see release in Japan in the arcades in the year of 2000. Like Marvel vs Capcom 2 and the Capcom vs SNK games, this title was developed to run on Sega Naomi hardware, the arcade gaming counterpart to the Sega Dreamcast, meaning that, that Capcom had more power to work with this time than with the more basic Sony ZN technology. Anyway, let us take a look at this amazing game. No! 
The opening sequence of the game basically establishes this fighter's plot. One year has passed since the events of the original game and things are back to normal in the city. The characters have gone back to resume their school lives and are enjoying the calm peace. However, the peace hasn't lasted and the cast have found themselves in a new battle. The intro goes on to show off some of the characters from the series. Polygon rendered in their new Sega Naomi glory. From there, hand-drawn illustrations of who appear to be the game's new main antagonist flashes up along with multiple comic book-like depictions of other representatives from the franchise, all in all establishing a new arc for the series, which we shall cover more on shortly. In the arcade selectable story mode, you start out by choosing a high school to play as, with each consisting of a combination of three characters. Instantaneously, you may notice that some of these schools have brand new characters within their combinations, and there is even a completely new school that has been added to the lineup as well. But once again, we will get to all of these new faces shortly. The first change you will notice from this screen is that you are prompted to select a team of three which is a departure from a team of two you are prompted to select in the game's previous instalment. Once again, it appears that Project Justice has taken influence one more time from the Capcom vs series, as Marvel vs Capcom 2 also upgraded its mechanics from two on two fights to three on three fights, so the natural progression makes a lot of sense. The fighting system within this game is lifted from the first Rival Schools title 2, However, some notable changes are brought to the table, such as the 3 on 3 combat we just mentioned. This alteration means there are more opportunities to perform team up attacks in this entry, but also adds the ability to carry out a new type of attack. These are known as party up attacks, a 3 person special move that varies based on which character is initiating the attack. The extra member also gives players the ability to cancel opponents team up specials. This can be achieved by inputting a team up counter command. If this turn of events takes place, short fighting sequences between one character from each team occurs. If the player who initiated this sequence gets the first hit in prior to the time expiring, then the incoming team up attack will be cancelled, switching the game back to the main fight. If the opposing players get the first hit in, or the time limit simply runs out, then the team up attack will be executed, all in all offering a very interesting dynamic for competitive play. The vigor meter present from the previous Rival Schools game also makes a return, however this time it is limited to 5 levels as opposed to 9. Different techniques require the vigor meter to be filled to different levels. A 3 person party up attack costs an entire 5 levels, whereas team ups cost 2 and cancels only cost 1, meaning you need to be somewhat economical with your choices of moves. Attacks literally come at a cost. The arcade version of this game offers two different play modes, the first of which being story. Story mode lets you pick from a preformed team of characters, representing a particular school. As we mentioned earlier, this is so players can follow a rigid storyline. Fights come with before and after cutscenes to help progress the story along, but these can vary due to the plot having branching paths, which are determined by match results and decisions made by the combatants. The arcade version also offers free mode, which annoyingly did not allow players at the time of release to play the game for free. However, the joke is on Capcom now, as anyone can emulate this game and play free mode for free. Yeah, so at least there is that. Anyway, free mode lets you form a team out of any three characters you want, and matches take place against other random teams of three. 
This mode features no story and offers the same amount of freedom provided by Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Both modes end with a boss fight, which we will touch on more shortly, as it is now time to discuss the game's story and new characters. As mentioned earlier in the video, the game is set one calendar year after the previous entry in the series. In Project Justice, a mysterious group comes to the forefront known as the Reverse Society. This group appears to be headed by a cold-hearted, ruthless ninja assassin known as Kuro Kirishima. The group has ambition to rule Japan, so therefore need to take out anyone who would be capable of stopping them. Due to this, Kuro attacks Reizo, the principal of Justice High and the father to Batsu, who are both recurring characters from the last game. Kuro also sends his minions, including his loyal subordinate Momo and older sister Yuruka, to cause tension and distrust within the other rival schools, and also carry out a plot to brainwash the leader of the Guido gang to cause more issues. The final string to Kuro's evil bow is his plan to destroy Batsu, which he executes by disguising himself as a Batsu doppelganger so that he can attack other fighters, leading them to believe Batsu himself was committing the crimes. So, as you can see, Kuro exists to cause tension between all of the game's schools and fighters, causing them to fight against each other once again, which is a fun little plot really, and a decent reason for everyone to be fighting all over again. Believe it or not, Kuro does not end up being the game's final end boss but instead the final battle takes place against Hayo, like in the previous game. Story-wise, Hayo has become possessed by his father Musion, and is consumed by hatred and evil as a result. This demonically possessed version of Hayo is creatively known as Demon Hayo, who is a topless sword-wielding maniac, reminiscent of Sephiroth and all the other Tesco value David Bowie clones we get in Japanese games. So with the basic skeleton structure of the story explained, let's run through the new characters this entry brings to the table. The sporty school known as Gorin High has a new student known as Momo, who we touched on earlier in the video, who is a mole and ally to Kuro. Whilst this tennis player is on the side of the game's villain, she is only doing so for fun rather than being innately evil herself. The school, full of American transfer students, specific High, remains with an unchanged lineup from the previous game, as does Guido High, the school known for its gang problem. The Super Elite Academy, Justice High's lineup remains unchanged too. The completely new school the game includes is Sijian High, an all-girls school that promotes the motto of raising women who display feminine virtues and the value of the time on the traditions of Japan. Akira, previously of Guido High, has been sent to this offshore island school. However, this school has a secret underground all-female gang problem. Joining Akira at this school, we also have Zaki, a gang leader, who is confrontational and rough around the edges, but someone who can be forgiven to her friends. Then we have Eureka, the sister of Kuro, who we have touched on earlier in this video. She is seen to be high class and even fights using the violin as a weapon. This girl is basically the female equivalent of me. Also, non affiliated from the schools, as discussed earlier, we also have the game's main antagonist, Kuro, the character responsible for brainwashing several characters in the game and bringing chaos amongst the schools. In fairness, Kuro is most central to the plot of all. So, we have discussed this arcade game's new fighter mechanics, story, and additional characters this one brought to the franchise. In terms of visually, how this game looks, it is a big step up from the previous installment on the PlayStation, with the Sega Naomi giving players a game with smoother polygons with less jaggedy edges. As a result, Project Justice has aesthetically aged a lot better than the earlier Rival Schools game that was created to run on Sony ZN hardware. These stages offer a nice selection of backdrops that vary in appearance, 
with obviously many appearing to emulate school settings. We have classrooms, playgrounds and playing fields amongst the selection of stages, as well as a few backdrops that have nothing to do with schools that break things up a little bit. My personal favourite, for example, is the train stage, simply because the level provides a bit more going on in the background. With the Sega Naomi and Sega Dreamcast being so architecturally similar, many elements of the eventual home release of the title on the Dreamcast remained unchanged, and graphically, the title looks just as impressive as it did on arcade hardware. The game would see a Japanese release in December of the year 2000, a European release in April of 2001 as Project Justice Rival Schools 2, and finally a North American release in May of 2001 simply as Project Justice. Like many fighting games that got transferred from the arcades to the home, a range of new play modes were implemented. In addition to the game's story and free arcade play modes, the game adds a training mode, league battles and tournament battle options. The Japanese version of this game and the international version, however, are completely different. If you watched my video on rival schools, you will know the school sim mode present in the Japanese version was not included in the Western release. This was partially due to the dating sim not being something that most Westerners would find appealing within a game. So, this play mode that offers the opportunity to create your own player was cut from the Western release of the PlayStation Classic. Interestingly, in the Dreamcast game, Project Justice, the creator player mode makes a return, but the dating sim element is gone and has been replaced with a board game format. Interestingly, like the dating sim previously, the ball game mode was also axed from international releases. Instead, the western version of Project Justice offers a range of extra characters to play as, all of which are made up of assets present within the creator player mode from the Japanese version, so each version of the game has its own individual merits. So. That was a basic rundown of the game and its port. So now let's see what journos of the time thought of this game on release. GameSpot stated, Capcom's Rival Schools was an arcade fighting game that became a PlayStation sleeper hit. The unique game had a nice fun fighting system and the character designs were unlike anything else on the market. These things came together to make the original game a success, and it's these same things that make the oft-delayed Dreamcast sequel worth picking up. Rival Schools looked good for a PlayStation game, and Project Justice makes for a good-looking Dreamcast game. Originally designed for the Sega Naomi hardware in arcades, the Dreamcast version looks virtually identical to its coin-op counterpart. The characters look great and they're animated well enough. The game's soundtrack consists of wah heavy guitar rock and the game's sound effects are typical fighting game fare. It is a must own for fans of the series and a game worth looking at if you're looking for a fun stylish fighter. IGN would praise this game too, stating, while not trying to enter the arena of a Soul Calibur, the graphic quality of Project Justice is pretty good. Nice 3D backgrounds and some fun looking character models really give this game a distinct look. With the power of the Dreamcast, you get a cleaner, more colourful version than the Rival School series on the PlayStation. Project Justice has a pretty solid fighting engine, but as I stated above, this game does not take itself seriously. If you didn't know that from the wacky character designs, you'll definitely notice it when playing the game. Project Justice delivers hilarious fighting action for those that never took high school too seriously. All in all, Project Justice received strong reviews, with many journalists commenting that the game was essentially a more polished version of Rival Schools that had appeared on the PlayStation previously. 
this is pretty much the perfect summation of what the game is and the reasons to play it. In my previous video I made about Rival Schools, my main criticism for the game was its ugly dated polygon graphics. Project Justice on the other hand offers much more palatable visuals that are a little more easy on the eyes today. Project Justice did little to really change the game, however it is to this day still the final and most polished title in the whole Rival School series. Considering there is not a bad title in the franchise's history, it is a crying shame that Capcom have appeared to put this game to rest. Even amongst Capcom's fighting crossover games, character representation from the Rival School franchise has been at a bare minimum. I think the chances of seeing Batsu and Co showing up in a Super Smash game in the future is pretty much non-existent, which is a crying shame really as these titles deserve nothing but respect. Previously on this YouTube channel I have taken you all on an odyssey, slowly making our way through looking at every Capcom crossover fighting title. Starting at Ground Zero we originally looked at X-Men vs Street Fighter. But now we have been on a journey together looking at games chronologically from release, from the Marvel vs Capcom series to the Capcom vs SNK games. With two great crossover series under Capcom's belt, they left fans wondering what exciting crossover we would get next. Capcom would soon answer this question in 2004 when they decided to release an um, Capcom vs Capcom game. This title, which we looked at in depth last week, known as Capcom Fight and Evolution, was a shoddily put together rush job made from the crumbling remains of the cancelled 3D fighting game created by the company the previous year, known as Capcom Fighting All Stars. The cancellation of Fighting All Stars, followed by the failings of Capcom Fight and Evolution, meant that this would be Capcom's last crossover fighting game for quite some time and the period Capcom had gone through of putting 4 or 5 different fighting games out a year seemed to be over, leading to somewhat of a low period fighting game wise for the company. In many ways the name was ironic, as although the title was known as Capcom Fighting Evolution, it contributed towards devolving the company's fighting game brand. Prior to all of this, as you will be aware from my previous uploads, Street Fighter 3 was not the cash cow the company had been hoping for either and was a massive commercial failure with the long awaited sequel and its updates only selling a pitiful 80,000 units on the Sega Dreamcast. The fighting game golden age for Capcom seemed to be over with both the Street Fighter brand and the crossover fighting game brand both becoming exhausted. By 2004 crowds of geeks were gathering at competitive fighting game events like EVO but the average gamer had moved on to newer and more innovative game adventures and if they did fancy a fighting game fix, they would simply power up Street Fighter 2 for a buzz of nostalgic quality. This of course would all change drastically with the release of Street Fighter 4 in the arcades in 2008, a game that with its upgrades and reiterations would go on to sell over 9 million units making it Capcom's most popular fighting game since the release of the legendary Street Fighter 2. We will cover what led to all of this on the channel soon, maybe even next week. Let's see how I feel. But today, let's put our focus elsewhere. Street Fighter 4 was not the only new Capcom fighting game released in the arcades that year. We also got the release of Tatsunoko vs Capcom, a brand new crossover fighting game. Let's imagine you are the average western gamer watching this video. You will notice a lot of your Capcom favourites mixed with a bunch of spandex clad superheroes and massive fighting robots. The latter examples are obviously examples of representation from the Tatsunoko brand. So let's quickly cover who Tatsunoko actually are. Tatsunoko are a Japanese production company originally established in 1962. The anime pioneers first big hit was a TV series released in 1965 known as Space Ace. Since then the company have gone on to produce countless anime TV shows and movies which is the source material from where roster members in the game on the Tatsunoko side of things originate from, who we shall run through individually when we get to the character segment of this video. 
Speaking of the game's characters, past the game's introduction, we are exposed to the crossover lineup of Capcom and Tatsunoko fighters further when we reach the character select screen. But hold on a minute players, on the select screen you select not one, but two fighters, instantly pleasing Teddy Long. Holla holla holla! Straight away you will notice that this game varies greatly graphically from any previous Capcom vs fighting game as all the characters in the game are fully rendered in 3D. Fights take place within a 2.5D environment. This is due to 3D looking characters being restricted to a two dimensional plane. As you would have gathered from selecting two fighters earlier, like all the other Capcom vs games, the title features tag team based combat, with the obvious goal of depleting opponents life bars. If a player selects two fighters, they are completely switchable during matches, however a completely new mechanic is introduced in this game with the addition of alternatively selecting one of two giant characters the game has. These two bigger more powerful characters can be chosen individually to use instead of a two person team. Powerful team moves can also be performed by pairs of two. These are executed when the character not in play is called upon to perform an assist. The arcade version of this game has a control scheme consisting of a joystick and a multi-button layout. However, the console controls would be simplified, which we shall cover more on shortly. In all versions of the game, in addition to assists, characters can perform light, medium and strong attacks, and these attacks can be strung together to perform combos. On top of this, characters can perform what is known as universal techniques. These are more powerful special attacks that require more complex control inputs. Further from this, other input combinations can also be used to perform hyper combos and team hyper combos, which vary in damage depending on how full the player's hyper combo gauge is. Going back to universal techniques, these can also be used to launch opponents upwards to perform air combos. Universal techniques also include the rock combo, which does significant damage but reduces the using player's health and the Mega Crash technique, which also drains the user's life bar, but puts a temporary barrier around the player. So that is basically how the combat in the game is executed. So now, before we move on to talking about the characters within this game and the game's console ports, let us take a look at the title's development history. The ball of the production of this game began to roll in 2006, when Tatsunoko themselves approached Capcom with the suggestion of creating a game using their character library. Ryoto Nitsuma, producer at Capcom, was instantly interested in creating a fighting game and quickly got everyone on board at the two companies to agree to use Tatsunoko within the next Capcom vs fighting title. This project was a particularly interesting one as there would be a 7 year gap between the release of this title and the last true crossover published by the company, Capcom vs SNK2. The research and development team working on this title began work on the project in parallel with Street Fighter 4, with the ambitious aim of bringing Capcom fighting games back to the mainstream market. This was hoped to be achieved through slightly lowering the barrier for entry with the game, as the company had noticed an unprofitable trend where only extremely hardcore fans were still playing fighting games. These people took fighting games a lot more serious than those who made up the market where the money actually was. Street Fighter 3 is one of the primest examples of a game that suffers from such an issue. Through the time period, fighting games were dropping in popularity. The casual market though was growing larger than ever before with the Nintendo Wii proving to the world that there was a huge market out there for more simplistic games. For this reason, the arcade game development would be shifted with a future console release on the Nintendo Wii in mind. Capcom would hire a development house known as Aitin, who they would task with the development of this game. Nitsuma is quoted to have stated, Aitin, Capcom's hired developer, took on the job in early 2007. Tatsunoko vs Capcom's design was a departure from the complex attack systems of the Street Fighter series and of certain vs titles. The game is built around a simplified 3 button attack system. It was inspired by the control systems commonly used by both the vs series and the Wii which allows intricate moves to be performed with basic control inputs. The game's release would finally be announced in May of 2008 with a release set for the Japanese arcades. The arcade cabinets contained boards that used proprietary hardware based on the Nintendo Wii. 
The game was 70% ready by September of that year, with a Japanese release on the Wii also announced and confirmed. The game would eventually hit Japanese arcades in December of that same year. When creating this game, although Tatsunoko characters could be nominated by Capcom to use, they soon realised that they faced limitations as certain characters would entail licensing issues that would prevent them from being used. Some characters were even rejected for use by Tatsunoko, without even explanations given. Nitsuma states, we weren't privy to a lot of their decision making process. They didn't share a lot of reasons with us. When they said no, and we asked why, they wouldn't tell us, but would give us another suggestion. They disallowed characters from Samurai Pizza Cats, despite the high number of fan requests for the latter. The characters who were ultimately chosen were generally characters the team enjoyed during their youth. Capcom also opted to have a roster with a good balance of male and female fighters, as well as a hero heavy lineup as opposed to villains. Once all the fighters were cleared for use, they could then begin designing a roster of balanced fighters. With regards to the game's fighting lineup, let us now take a bit of the time to run through the members of this game's roster. Let's keep it simple by first running through Capcom's offerings. For the first time in history, the roster in this Capcom vs game was not Street Fighter heavy. I feel this could be down to two possible reasons, or simply a combination of both. My first thought is that it could be because Street Fighter 4 was in development simultaneously, and they did not want to overdose the consumer on Street Fighter again. Alternatively, maybe the company just never had the same faith in the brand that they once did. Despite all of this, we have Chun-Li and Ryu who are most synonymous with Street Fighter 2, and Alex is selectable of Street Fighter 3 Infamy. Morrigan from the Darkstalker series is present as expected, and fantastically, Batsu is present, flying the flag for the rival school's franchise. From the Mega Man series, we have Roll returning, joined absurdly by Mega Man Volnut from Mega Man Legends, which is quite surprising really, as any sane person hates Mega Man Legends. Yuck. But I guess this is compensated somewhat with the addition of Zero from Mega Man X, the greatest Mega Man series. In addition to these characters, we have the superhero, Beautiful Joe, from the stylistic, popular at the time beat-em-up, Beautiful Joe, a game that was artistically the most stylistic in the genre since Comic Zone. Hmm, perhaps I should maybe look back at this game on here soon. On the more obscure side of things, we have Saki, from the hybrid quiz game and dating sim known as Quiz Nanero Dreams. The Japanese are such odd perverts. The other three representatives are characters from newer Capcom releases that came out in a similar time frame to the game. These include Frank West from Dead Rising, PTX40A from Lost Planet, and Keijin no Soki from Onimusha, who all illustrate that Capcom were no longer mainly leaning on characters from their fighting franchises. That rounds up everyone on the Capcom side of things, which means now it's time to look at Tatsunoko's fighters. Full disclosure here, I know absolutely nothing about anime, with of course the exception of the greatest ones ever, such as Pokemon and Dragon Ball Z. You know, the ones normal people watched. But nonetheless, here is my idiot's guide to the character lineup representing Tatsunoko. First we have Ken the Eagle, June the Swan and Joe the Condor, from a property known as Gatchaman. The show is an animated franchise about a five-member superhero squad. If you are around my age, you will probably vaguely be able to remember an English dub of the show on Fox Kids known as Eagle Riders. Although the original series of the show aired in Japan in 1972 and was first adapted in the English-speaking world as an adaptation entitled Battle of the Planets back in 1978. Then we have characters from a property known as Kashan. Kashan himself is an android with the human consciousness. Originally a person, he turned himself into an android to hunt down and destroy the robots that have taken over his world. The show first aired in Japan in 1973, but received a live action reboot in 2004. Next we have Polymer from Hurricane Polymer. Once again, this is another Japanese superhero. Originally a regular police officer, Takeshi obtained from a scientist a new artificial polymer, Polymet, that was far stronger than steel. With this polymet, Takeshi transformed himself into Hurricane Polymer, a costumed hero who fights for justice. 
This 1974 show was remade in 1996 and later released in English on VHS in 1998. We have a range of characters from a franchise known as Yatterman. The show aired from 1977 to 1979 but would see a remake in 2008, the same year this game came out. The plot of the show revolves around a mysterious stone known as the Skull Stone, which has pieces scattered all over Earth. Once all pieces are assembled, the stone reveals the location of the world's largest gold deposit. Playable characters in this game include Mask Heroes, Yataman 1 and Yataman 2, whose goal in the series is to stop the stone falling into the wrong hands. Another playable character in this game includes one of the show's villains. The Ronjo is an attractive blonde who leads the Dorombo gang in locating the Daruko stone. Further from this we have Hakushon. He is a genie from the anime The Genie Family, which first aired in 1970. Hakushon grants wishes but consistently messes them up due to his own extreme clumsiness. The show was localised to English as Bob the Bottle in 1992. Karas is a playable character from a more modern Tatsunoko property simply known as Karas that saw release in 2005. The show is a horror story with a vengeance theme. The protagonist, Karas, is on a quest to slaughter Mikaris to recover the body part of his murdered lover. Pretty dark stuff really. Tickerman is a character from 1975, a space knight who received an English adaptation in 1984. The show is set at the dawn of the 21st century, and scientists are on the hunt for a second Earth. This search is hindered though due to issues with aliens, but a scientist designs the Tech Setter system, designed to combat the aliens by augmenting a human with a certain wavelength into a Tickerman giving them enhanced strength abilities, resulting in this character right here. The show would receive an even more popular sequel set 10 years later, known as Tekman Blade, which would air in 1992. The Earth is under attack by aliens once more, and the even cooler looking Tekman Blade is the star of this property. We also have Ipatsuman from a 1982 show, Gaiakuten Ipatsuman. Ipatsuman is the pilot of a super robot. The show sounds like it was about big business who lease out powerful robots with notorious villains being top executives who work at the more questionable firm. Last but not least we have Gold Lightan, a huge gold robot from the 1981 show Golden Warrior Gold Lightan. The story is about a young boy named Hiro Takai who finds a gold lighter which turns out to be the giant golden warrior gold lighter who has the mission to save the earth from an invasion by King Ibalda. I hope that gives you a brief explanation of who all these very Japanese fighters are and I am sure some more weeby members watching today can shed even further light on this crazy roster. But as you can see from all of this Tatsunoko vs Capcom offers a very, very different roster to any Capcom fighting game released previously. Out of all of the characters featured within this video, some of them are actually exclusive to each of the three different versions of this game. The first two versions of the game were released exclusively in Japan, which makes a lot of sense considering how Japanese the character lineup is. The first two versions, both known as Tatsunoko vs Capcom Cross Generation Heroes, obviously existed in two different forms, an arcade version and a Wii version. Apart from a slightly different character roster, the Wii version of the title contains an exclusive minigame system for each character to participate in, which adds a little more variety to the title. The home version of the game also includes all the tropes of a fighting game of that type. There is a regular arcade mode, a survival mode, a time attack and versus mode everything you would expect really from a game of this breed. You also obtain money throughout the game so that you can purchase a range of features including unlockable characters, giving the game an extra edge of replayability. As mentioned though, sadly both of these versions of the game would never leave Japan, but the West along with the rest of the world would finally receive Tatsunoko vs Capcom Ultimate All-Stars at a later date. On May 6, 2009, Capcom listed two mystery games as part of their Electronic Entertainment Expo 2009 lineup. 
Nintendo Power Magazine revealed Capcom Mystery Game No. 1 to be the North American localization of Tatsunoko vs. Capcom cross-generation of heroes, with the new subtitle Ultimate All-Stars. The game was playable at E3 of that year, with European and Australian release dates also announced later that same year. There was originally no intention to release the game outside of Japan, but the game got such a positive reaction from fans that it became a must for the company. The release was a tedious process for Capcom, as many Tatsunoko property rights were held by Time Warner outside of Japan, and licensing in North America and Europe were often held by different rights holders. This tedium would lead to time constraints issues that led Capcom to replacing the character specific mini games with Ultimate All Shooters, an expansion of the PTX40A mini game. An official launch event for Tatsunoko vs Capcom Ultimate All Stars was held at the Nintendo World Store in the Rockefeller Center on January 23, 2010, featuring autograph signings by Nitsuma, giveaways, competitions, and playable demo kiosks. Certain versions of Tatsunoko vs Capcom Ultimate All Stars were bundled with a Mad Cat's arcade stick, which I must say looks particularly spiffing. In regards to the popularity of a very Japanese game in the West, Capcom's community manager Seth Killian expressed satisfaction with the North American sales of Ultimate All Stars. Tatsunoko vs Capcom certainly beats the initial expectations. It didn't set any land speed records, but it was a success, Killian stated and that really says something considering that we're talking about a game that was not only never coming out, but has a title that most people can't even pronounce. In regards to the game's overall reception, Famitsu would score the game's original incarnation a solid 8 out of 10, praising the game for both the character lineup and the fighting game mechanics. When the later worldwide version of the game was released, Tatsunoko vs Capcom Ultimate All-Stars would also receive positive reviews, with an average score of 85% on review aggregate sites, Metacritic and game rankings. The game would also receive a lot of praise for successfully balancing accessibility and depth. GameSpot would state that its use of fewer buttons may seem less complex, but this simplicity belies the depth of each character's moveset. Eurogamers stated that compared to the separate buttons for punches and kicks in Marvel vs Capcom 2 New Age of Heroes, Tatsunoko vs Capcom's streamlined approach was moderately easy to learn. The game is a slightly slower and more user friendly Marvel without losing the ability to pull off crazy 50 plus hit combos. Ben Kuchira of Arts Technica wrote that its over the top attacks can be huge colourful screen filling blasts of light and movement and that combos flash across the screen, claiming you landed billions of points of damage. 1UP.com found that each character played in a vastly different way. There are characters who take advantage of sheer speed and long range moves, others who use momentum to apply pressure to opponents, and those who rely on a single opportune moment to deal vast amounts of damage. GamePro contrasted the game with Marvel vs Capcom 2, contributing that every combatant in Tatsunoko feels carefully designed to be unique, intriguing, and most importantly, worth investing time in mastering. The game's soundtrack also proved popular with Game Daily, highlighting its fantastic mix of strong techno tunes and dramatic battle themes. So now that you have watched this video, I hope that you have gained a clearer picture of what Tatsunoko vs Capcom is, and why it appeared as a constant exclusive for the Nintendo Wii of all things. The game was part of Capcom's new direction to get fighting games back into the hands of the mainstream, and back in 2006 to 2007, the Wii seemed like the most sensible way to achieve this. Despite all of this though, Tatsunoko is still not a well known brand in the West. Due to this, the release of this game still went completely over many Westerners heads, in spite of the game's high quality and playability. Also, as of November 7, 2012, Capcom USA's Senior Vice President Christian Svensson revealed that Capcom's rights with Tatsunoko had lapsed, meaning Capcom is no longer authorised to sell Tatsunoko vs Capcom physically or digitally, which is why we have never seen this pop up anywhere since the Wii's initial release. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this journey back into Capcom's past examining the history of the Rival Schools franchise, its significance to gaming and Batsu's re-emergence in the newer Capcom vs Tatsunoko games. 
If we are really lucky, Akira's upcoming appearance in Street Fighter V could be test marketing for an all new Rival Schools game, but only time will tell when it comes to such matters. One thing is for sure, Rival Schools games will always represent an important part of fighting game history. Yeah! It is possible to do deep dives on such games, in part due to the generous support I receive from the channel via Patreon. So before I go, I would like to give massive thank yous to... Sebastian Velez, A Murder of Crows, Carl Johnson, Heo Paula Lopez, Ben Haradine, Corey Imar Sr., Capcom vs SNK, Bux of Gotham, Rowan Dinched, Evan Boulder, Philip Namp, Asma Rokai, Keith Ferguson, Jock Vimarella, Michael Cullix, Ago, Jordan Duran, Angel Eye 35, Nick Daniels, Prince of Zana, Glennie Glenn, Daniel Daly, Computer Man, House of the Ted, Craig Jenkins, ECU Professor, Kid Anime, Justin Wang, Aaron McNamara, Hermes Gonzalez, Instant Gratification Monkey, Man Shovel, James Bishop, JB, Michael Hall, Wesley Sanghee, Wayne Kerr, Langston Miller, New, Brian Barry, Sarah Powell, Vlamic Renee, Marvin Arrowliga, Chris Cool, TOG Driver, Adrian Hannington, Bernard NG, Richard Stu Stewart, James McDonald, Dan Van Dammit, Louis Viant, John Bates, David Bell, Chris Fisk, Mike Bruno, Rick67, Antonio Rodriguez, Retroverse.com, Casey Wright, Synth Spaces, Zai, Andrew Bazanski, Gunther Hendricks, and everybody else who supports the channel on whatever platforms. Thank you so much for helping me make these videos. Yeah! Cheerio and ta-ta and farewell.